All right, my kind of campaign is kind of different from everybody else's. It's more like a branding and marketing campaign, um, and it's about Under Armour, and it's called Rule Yourself. So a little bit of background information. Um, Under Armour athlete Michael Phelps will be the most watched and celebrated athlete of the 2016 Rio Olympics. Um, he was basically known as the greatest swimmer of all time and one of the greatest American Olympic athletes of all time. He finished his career with 24 Olympic gold medals, and he really came onto the scene in the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. And then the, after the 2012 Olympics in London, which he dominated, he initially retired due to health concerns and a little bit of the fame of winning these gold medals kind of got to him because he's a very shy person. So he, he then, I think it was like two or three years before the 2016 Rio Olympics, he unretired and he said this would be his last go around. And this is basically like his swan, his swan song, some, I guess you could say, because it's like his last go around. So the biggest problem with um, for Under Armour was under Armour was not an Olympic sponsor, so they couldn't associate with the Olympic Games due to Rule 40, which is implemented by the IOC, which is the International Olympic Committee. So Rule 40 basically broke down means um, to preserve the unique nature of the Olympic Games by preventing over-commercialization and to allow the focus to remain on the athlete. So basically, if you weren't a sponsored athlete for the American team, you couldn't tweet, you couldn't post, you couldn't say anything about the prospective athletes that you sponsored. Um, for America, I think it was Nike, Tide, and Gatorade. Those were three of the um, the biggest um, official partners for the Olympic Games. So Under Armour had to come up with a campaign that was needed to allow um, that a campaign was needed that would let Under Armour own the 2016 Rio Games without referring to them, and to use the world's most highly awarded athlete without mentioning his wins, and to use Phelps to help build their brand because Under Armour was still trying to fight against Nike and Adidas in order to get more publicity and get more brand awareness. So some of the PR marketing challenges, um, like I said before, they were locked out of the Olympics from July 27th to August 24th. So nine days prior to the opening ceremony on July 27th to three days um, after the closing ceremony, they couldn't tweet, couldn't say anything. And if they did break a violation or break Rule 40 by the IOC, any athlete that they talked about, they can be stripped of their awards and they also can be punished by, the, by their prospective country. Um, another uh, challenge was one of the, this is one of the uh, noisiest marketing environments on the planet. 2016 Olympics would be one of the most cluttered advertise, advertising environments of all time. And over 400 brands spent north of $1 billion in and around the Olympic, uh, the Rio Olympics in the United States alone. And Michael Phelps was um, an overexposed asset with personal issues um, that they had to overcome. So after the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, after the 2012 Olympics in London, he got sponsored by Visa, Subway, Louis Vuitton. He was all over the place. He was on all commercials. He was also sponsored by Crest. Like he was on the TV constantly. So this made Under Armour's job a little hard in order for them to get a little more spotlight leading up to the Olympics because they had the rules that they had to follow. So three objectives that they wanted to accomplish was they wanted to create brand buzz, increase sales, and lift brand considerations. So by putting Michael Phelps and Under Armour on top of the conversations ahead and during the Olympics, despite the rules and regulations, they want to increase sales of Under Armour's training apparel from the launch of the campaign to the end of the games. And they want to lift brand considerations, which basically means they want to translate buzz into increased consideration for the brand versus Nike, which was an established Olympic sponsor with a large state of athletes, significant advertising presence. So Under Armour's insight and strategy was basically to shine a spotlight on the sacrifice, not the glory of the medals that Michael Phelps won, and to bring to life Under Armour's point of view on athletic achievement, and to tell the raw authentic story of Michael Phelps, um, training far away from the spotlight of the Olympics. Um, the short film portrayed the endless hours in the pool, brutal sessions at the gym, and active recovery and diet. And I have a, a one minute video I want to show. Uh,
So for Under Armour, by them not saying, there's a certain amount of words that the Rule 40 states that you cannot say or it'd be a violation. So for the commercial, for them to not say any of the words or to mention Michael Phelps' name or anything like that, they were able to play this ad during the Olympics. So they kind of found a way to maneuver around the rule and also um, help brand exposure. So for the media rollout, the ad I just showed you, um, the Under Armour's TV ad and online film initially launched on March 8, 2016. So they launched the ad, I think three to four months before the Olympic game started on July 27th. So by launching months before the Olympics, the brand outflanked its rivals, which was Nike, Adidas, and Puma. Um, to reach its core audience, Under Armour aired many different versions of these commercials in the middle of major sporting events, depending on the sport. So for football, they had Tom Brady. For basketball, they had Steph Curry. And for golf, they had Jordan Spate. And they couldn't do for skiing, because that was Lindsey Vaughn. But they, they didn't come out with a, um, a women's, um, they didn't have a women's athlete. And Under Armour CEO Patrick Fitz said, Under Armour won in the, Under Armour won in the competition. It wasn't even allowed to enter. Beating favorites in the process, it did so by defining the cliches and conventions of the category, finding a more authentic side to one of the world's most heavily sponsored athletes, and staying true to his values. Do it yourself. So the three um, objectives that they really wanted to accomplish, they did. So they created brand, uh, they created brand buzz. They received 10 million views on YouTube, 3 million views on Facebook and Twitter, um, 8.5 earned media impressions, 78.5 million earned uh, media values. They had 107,000 uh, likes and shares across all social media platforms. It was the second most shared Olympic spot of 2016 and the fifth most shared Olympic ad of all time. And as far as um, their competition with Nike, um, for lift brand consideration, they were up 20% and Nike was up 1%. Um, and they also increased sales. So the company shares 8.4% increased during the Olympics as far as, and as far as Nike, they stayed flat. They really didn't have no, they really didn't gain any traction. So for my conclusion, the two people I talked to were Joshua Brunner, who um, works at um, UL um, in the athletic and marketing department. And I also talked to a guy named Montreal McGraw, who I grew up with, who I didn't know. He's the co-leader of the marketing department for Nike. He played at the University of Oregon, and he's located in Oregon, but he runs the Southern region. And I talked to him, and he kind of gave me the input of what their team at Nike talked about because they're competitors. And he gave some good things about Nike. He gave some good things about the campaign, but he also gave a negative, which I'm going to at the end. So he said the income, brand value, and brand exposure all seem to improve from the beginning of the campaign to the very end. In addition to the rule, rule yourself ad becoming one of the most shared Olympic spots ever on social media, the commercial also won top prize of the 2016 Kings Lions International Festival of Creativity. This was the first time a sports ad from Under Armour or any other Nike or Adidas won that award. And Under Armour reached its highest brand value of 5.5 billion by the end of 2016. So the campaign had really struck gold. And this was a good way for Michael Phelps to go out on top because he won five gold medals and one silver. And it also helped Under Armour um, top Adidas and get right behind uh, Nike as far as um, not, uh, as far as apparel and clothing and shooting and stuff like that, and shoes and stuff like that. The only negative of the campaign that Montreal said was that the company did fail to capitalize on the female demographic. So out of the 4.8 billion in revenue in 2016, only 1 billion came out of the women's apparel and shoes. And that's primarily because um, they really didn't have that many women um, at least that were sponsored by Under Armour. And they really didn't use Lindsey Vaughn like they could have used Michael Phelps. And that's primarily because Michael Phelps was probably the most recognizable athlete on the planet at that time. And as far as my principles, I stated in my paper.